In this shorter version of 25 Minute Fizz, I'm gonna be taking you through what are called the seven modifiable variables. What that means are these are the things you can change in your workouts or how you program for the workouts that will alter the adaptation you get. And in the end of the day, that's what we're all after, right? We're trying to get a certain outcome. That's what we call program design. It's a specific adaptation or desired, uh, desired adaptation. And so we need to be able to say, okay, you know, like you want A, B, and C, but not D. Okay, then I know exactly how to modify this, this, and this to get that adaptation. That's all we're talking about today. So what are those seven variables? Let's jump into it. But before we do that, we gotta understand how program design works. First of all, you have to understand what you're training for to begin with. Now, I've got a separate video on needs analysis. I think it's 25 or 55 minutes, I can't remember. But you need to run some sort of testing is the point. You can go watch that video. From there, you determine your goals. And now we get to our green step, which is what the focus of today is. Modifiable variables. This acronym, COFAVERP, that I like says, hey, you need to do, your goal is A, will now modify these seven things in this exact fashion and you will then get A as an adaptation. Hopefully that results in a change in performance that you're looking for. And then from there you would come back and redo the needs analysis or at least a portion of it to see what new goals you need to come up with. So that's the cycle, if you will, of program design that we should be going through for the most of the time we're training an individual. Athlete or not, it should be the same thing. We always should be training with a purpose. We should be doing that to the best of our, our, of our abilities, sorry. So let's jump right into it with the seven modifiable variables. Okay, now the ones in the, on the your right or so, I think, the ones in green, they're separated because those ones influence each other directly. So in other words, if you say reduce the rest you take between reps, that's probably going to reduce the amount of volume and or intensity you can do. If you go up in intensity, that's gonna reduce volume, etc. The other ones that are in the pinkish, grayish something color, whatever the hell that is, uh, they are important, of course, but they're not gonna necessarily guarantee direct relationship with the, with the other three. And so let's jump into those other ones first, starting with choice, and we'll go through order, frequency, progression, intensity, volume, and rest. Now, I'm not going to give you the full money on any one of these variables because I've already talked about them a lot in some of the other videos. So, hey, you can't get it all for free. You got to go, well, actually, all of it is free. Every single video I've ever done is free. There's nothing behind any paywall ever. So, to hell with yourself. It is free. <laughs> but it's not free time wise. You're going to have to spend some time watching more of the videos to pick up on all the other stuff. If not, every video would be like seven and a half hours. And my students would be very upset because they watch the same thing multiple times. That's not good for anybody. Anyways, choice is this, all right? You wanna get a certain adaptation. Your client comes, you do your needs analysis and you determine, all right, our training goal is A. Well, now you have to decide, okay, well, which exercises do I select that's gonna put me in the best position to get A? Now, we know from previous videos that exercises themselves do not guarantee a certain adaptation. So you can't come and say things like, all right, I wanna get stronger, therefore, I will pick a deadlift exercise because that deadlift is the best for strength. That's not true at all. It's not even close to true. Something against deadlifts, it's against your brain, right? Exercises themselves do not determine the adaptation. It's how you do them that matters. What's your rep ranges, rest, uh, intensity, things like that. So if we look at these two pictures and we are trying to determine, determine which of these overhead squat exercises is quote unquote better, we can't do that because exercises don't determine adaptation. What does determine the adaptation? It's the application. The sets, the reps, intensity, speed, technique, etc. Now, the exercises do determine certain things like the movement plane you're in, the muscles you're using, the types of contractions, and the technical proficiency. And so you may recognize this slide from one of my other videos. I'm definitely not gonna go through it. I think I spent about 20 minutes on this slide specifically. But these are some other things you would consider when selecting the exercise, right? How old are the individuals, their experience, their mobility, their flexibility. So in some cases, you may look at the uh, traditional overhead squat there and say, okay, because of these five reasons, today this is a better exercise selection than the one-legged standing on a medicine ball, one-armed overhead kettlebell squat. Other situations though, maybe that's the better choice than the traditional overhead squat. But the point I'm making is the exercises you select to do in your program do influence the adaptation or the outcome a little bit. Right? The next one, uh, C, O, oh, COFA verb, is order. Now I'm talking about order within a day. So this is, you're going to be doing four or five or six different exercises a day. Which one do you do first, second, third, fourth? 
Now, look at the pictures below. Imagine you're going to go out in the field and do some agility work. You're going to do some snatches for the day, some deadlifts, and then you're going to push a sled until you throw up. Which ones do you do first, second, and third? Well, the basics of exercise order would say this. Now, it's funny because if you're in my class 351, you're going to be noticing there's a structure to our entire class. What do we do first in the semester? And what do we do second, third, fourth, fifth? It's this, right? So you technically do the fastest things first. So you do speed, then power, then strength, then hypertrophy, and then any conditioning or endurance work at the end. And that's how I structure the class, right? Surprise, surprise. So that's, that's a traditional exercise order. Now, the reason you do it this way is a couple of things. Uh, of course, there's exceptions to the rules, but this is a general answer, okay? Number one, if you do, if you screw up this order or you do it in the inverse, say you do your conditioning first, well, you're going to slow down your speed. You're not going to be as strong. You'll be tired, so you won't be able to produce as much force. And we know from other videos, if we sabotage our force production, our speed, or our power output, we don't actually then get powerful or strong. Right? So you may think it's like a mental toughness thing or something like that, but you're using bad physiology. You're using bad program design. And some people say things like, well, my athletes need to be able to produce force or use their strength in the fourth quarter. Fine. If you want to talk about maintaining your power over time, cool. But that's different than increasing your max power or your max strength. These are different things. If the goal is to increase your maximum ability, if you do conditioning first, you'll be too tired and you'll decrease the benefit or the productivity for your speed power strengths up. Doing speed work first doesn't have that effect on conditioning. No one will ever have a less of a pump on their workout because they did power stuff before they went and did their hypertrophy session. And so we have a cost benefit thing to run here. If I do the conditioning endurance stuff first, it's gonna compromise my speed power strength. If I do my speed power strength stuff first, it doesn't compromise my conditioning or my hypertrophy at all. So there's a 100% win, no loss scenario in doing it in this order. The other thing to consider is the possibility of injury. So imagine you just did a thousand push-ups and burpees and overhead presses for time. And now well, my shoulder joint is incredibly fatigued. My stabilizer muscles, which are not big and strong muscles, are fatigued. And now I'm gonna actually put them in a scenario where I'm gonna ask them to move fast and at a maximum load. Uh, you're gonna increase the likelihood of that giving out. So for those two primary reasons, again, number one, you're gonna compromise your strength, and by strength I mean speed, power, strength, anything like that. And number two, our chances of injury probably go up a little bit. So we wanna make sure we do our conditioning and hypertrophy or whatever that is at the end. Okay, so that's exercise order within a day. Uh, F in our scenario here is called frequency, and don't, don't memorize this chart at all. It's just showing the concept of frequency refers to how many days a week you're training. So somebody, of course, in like the off season, uh, is gonna be training four, six times a week. And, and again, training, we're typically referring to in the weight room stuff, okay, not sport training. But of course, in competition, in the middle of a season, you're not gonna be lifting five days a week. Once, twice a week is probably pretty good because you got so much stuff going on in competition. You come out of that postseason, you ramp it up a little bit, you get the idea here. So point just meaning frequency refers to how many days a week are you training. If you're a competitive athlete, say Olympic weightlifter or a powerlifter, you might even be training, I got an MMA. It's not uncommon for the athletes I work with to train 14 to 18 times in a week. Do the quick math there, but that means they're training two to three times a day pretty consistently, right? So let's move on to those last three now, volume, intensity, and rest. Volume mathematically is repetitions times sets. So if you did three sets of 10 repetitions, your volume for the day would be 30. Now, we usually report this as a weekly total. You can do whatever you want, but in my class, for example, on your mesocycle project, you're gonna count up the total amount of repetitions you did in every one of your eight weeks, and then you're gonna plot that. So week one, total repetitions with 200. Week two's repetitions, 300. Week three's, et cetera, et cetera. Now, don't go from 200 to 300, right? Uh, other videos, we've talked about this, but you generally don't want to increase volume by more than 10% or so a week. Point being, though, you count up the total amount of repetitions that you do by that simple math that I just explained to you. Come back and look at this again when you do your mesocycle project if you get confused, but nonetheless. 
Now there's another term that I like called volume load. And this is the same thing as volume, but you multiply it by the load. And load is a way of saying, well, how much did you lift? A lot of practitioners are gonna tell you they actually like this a lot better because volume doesn't really explain what's going on in the body. Think of it this way. Imagine athlete A did three sets of 10 repetitions at 50 pounds. Okay, so that's 30 repetitions at 50 pounds. That's 1,500 total pounds I moved. If another athlete did three sets of 10 repetitions at 500 pounds, if I only looked at volume, both would just be at 30. But if I look at volume multiplied by how much they actually lifted, we got 1,500 multiplied by a whole lot more than 1,500. So volume load is probably a little bit more telling and a better indicator of what's actually stressing on the body and, and how much fatigue they're experiencing, which is the only reason we're calculating volume. We're trying to manage fatigue over time. Intensity is what we call the percentage of your one rep max. So intensity in the case of science and physiology is not a subjective terms. Oh, that was really intense workout. No, was it or was it not? What percentage of your one rep max was it? That determines intensity. So when we're speaking like that, that's what we're referring to. How heavy was it and how many reps, how many sets to totally do. When we report intensity though, and again for the mesocycle you'll do this, it's typically as an average weekly. So don't go count up all the intensities because they're all percentages and report a weekly intensity of 938. It's not gonna make any sense. What you're gonna do is kind of take all the repetitions and say, yeah, you know what, like for the most part, most of Monday was at 75%, most of Tuesday was at 80%, most of Wednesday was at 90%, so, all right, the average weekly volume was 82%, or whatever the heck it's gonna be. All right, now volume and intensity are inversely related. If you do three repetitions, you can only do so much weight, say 90%. Now if I go to do five repetitions, I have to drop the weight. There's just no way, or it wouldn't be the same number. I can't do two repetitions at my one rep max. By definition, then that wouldn't be my one rep max. So opposite, if I add load, I can't do as many repetitions if I'm truly at that percentage, right? So we have to appreciate and understand what happens with volume and intensity. Since we're getting to the end of the semester in class now, hopefully you can build out a schematic like this. I think this is a fantastic way to study for your final exam. And those of you at home, I think you should be able to look at the same thing as well. What I've plotted here is that relative percentage or intensity. And I've kind of laid out all the different training adaptations we discussed in my class and where they would land. I'm not gonna go through all of them now because I've done this in all of their own individual videos. You could do the same thing with repetitions per set though. Pay attention to a couple of things on both of these slides though. Notice how some of them go below zero and above 100%. How is this possible? Think through that, go watch the other videos. Same thing with repetitions. And it can't do less than zero reps, but some of these go really high into the repetition ranges, right? So you should be able to, without looking at a cheat sheet here, be able to know what intensity and what rep range do I do for all the different adaptations that we've covered this year. We've been working on a scorecard as well, so here's all of them in that same thing. And I've also added things like choice and order to it. So you can see, for example, when you're going to choose the exercises for speed. Just choose an exercise that allows you to move fast. A good example, a deadlift. A deadlift is not a great choice for speed because it's really hard to do it fast without smacking your knee. So choose a better exercise, probably. Same thing with bicep curl. We're probably not doing bicep curls for speed, but we could do pull-ups for speed. We could do bent row for speed. Of course, we could do any running or moving and things like that. Other end of the spectrum, take a look at muscular endurance. We might select our exercises by either the muscle we're specifically wanting to work or the movement pattern. That would be, either one of those would be acceptable methods, methods for choosing the exercise. But if we counter that with something like uh, strength, we don't really choose often, our, if we're training for strength, the exercise we want by a certain muscle group, we're usually training movement patterns there. All right, so again, depending on the adaptation you're looking for, how you select your exercises or the exercise choice variable changes depending on the adaptation. You can see the basic exercise order that we've covered all year, and that's in there as well. The repetition range, percent intensities, and of course, uh, the rest intervals at the very bottom. So we'll work on this in class, don't worry. Our last modifiable variable, the P in COFA verb, is progression. So what we're referring to here now is how do we progress the program over time? Now, 
we'll have more slides, we'll talk more specifically about periodization. But really this is a concept, and you've also seen this slide before. The concepts are few, the methods are many. You've also heard people say things like, well, coaching is a science and an art. Well, really what they're saying is the sciency part are the concepts, the art part are the methods. Okay, so as long as you're hitting these concepts, your program will probably work in terms of make sure you're selecting the adaptation that you wanna go for based on needs analysis. Make sure that you are progressively overloading somehow. That doesn't always necessarily mean by intensity, could be by volume. So you overload the distance you are covering or overload the amount of work you do. Could be by speed, could be by reducing rest intervals, a whole bunch of ways we can progress over time, but there has to be some sort of progressive overload. And while doing that, we want to balance stress and recovery, which is really all periodization is. We want to, what I call balance SED and LTD. So SED being specific adaptation to impose demand, which is specificity, right? So if you want to get better at push-ups, you can't just do push-ups every day. You're going to blow your shoulders up. So I also can't just do a bunch of upper back rehab and think I'm going to get better at bench pressing. So I want to do some specificity, but I also want to do some long-term athletic development stuff. And we want to balance that, right? Okay, so a little bit of very specific work, but then a little bit of maintenance work, a little bit of foundation work. Some sort of balance of that. How much you do of each is a really complicated answer, but you got to have some of both in the category. And then do whatever you got to do to maximize adherence. People got to do the program. From the art stuff, Hey, that's up for you to decide. Do you like to train in the mornings or do you like to train at night? Do you like to have speakers going and a whole crowd of people there? Do you train by yourself in your garage? That's really all up to you and that's important. So that's it. Those are the seven modifiable variables of program design. If you could do me a huge, huge favor, go have a great day. That's it. See you next time.